there was an incident in Southampton where unfortunately, Dave, two firefighters went into a building to make sure that everybody was out and in doing so, some cables became dislodged and they dropped. Them cables could tangle and they did. They got caught up on the apparatus of the two firefighters that were there that day. And unfortunately, because of that entanglement of those cables, those firemen never got out of that property. Hello and welcome to another CF Tech Talking Podcast. You've got myself, Darren Staniforth, and always ably assisted by Dave Austin. You're Hello, here, Darren. I'm here you're today here. again. You're here. Yes, Once I'm again. Still here. Yeah, next, still here. Next to you. Clinging on. Yes. <laughs> and, and we, we have... A- have the mm. IT here with us again, don't we? Michael P. We like it when Michael P. Yeah, on. thank you for it's popping in again. Yeah. We, get some, we, get some, we get a really good, 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 good grilling, don't we? We do. Good, well, good, he's, always, he's always prepared yeah. to give us the beans. We like yeah, that. He doesn't yeah. mind. He doesn't mind spilling the beans a bit. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about uh, the premature collapse. So this is cables that could collapse in the event of a fire. Yeah. How we should be fixing them, where we should be fixing them. That probably leads on to looking at these protected escape well, routes. Well, they were interesting, weren't they, in Amendment 2? And we had a lot of discussion about protected escape routes. So we, we need to really nail those to be certain what we're talking about. So, Michael, where do you want to start? Well, should we start at the beginning, Michael? Yeah. The beginning is probably a good place to it's start. It's always a good place to start. So I remember, quite a while ago now, um, it was introduced to the regulations that... Cables in an escape route should be fixed to avoid premature collapse. Yeah. That was the first attempt that JPL had at fixing. And that them. was the 18th, wasn't it? That appeared in the 18th. Well, I think that was before that. I think was so. That the third, yeah. edition, third amendment of the 17th. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. 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 Now um, on this, I think we need to just go back a little bit more and identify why. Mm. So my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, there was an incident in Southampton. Where unfortunately, Dave, two firefighters went into a building to make sure that everybody was out. And in doing so, some cables became dislodged and they dropped. Them cables could tangle and they did. They got caught up on the apparatus of the two firefighters that were there that day. And unfortunately, because of that entanglement of those cables, those firemen never got out of that property. So... The fire brigade, who do sit as part of JPL, started brought this along to the attention of the JPL committees and said, right, look, we need to do something about it. So the first thing to try and resolve this was they were looking at cables in escape routes, weren't they? And that was just the very start of it, Michael, wasn't it? Yeah, we, we started with escape routes and then um, thinking about it a bit further. Um, and like you say, it's not just the incident in Southampton. There's been quite a few incidents, actually. Mm. Um, and what we agreed was that it was cables in any area. Yeah, so it used to be just those cables in escape routes need to be fixed to stop pr- premature collapse. So... Now, I remember the big discussion because this was designated escape routes. And we it said, well, what, what are they? How, how do you know what an escape route is? And it was the, it was the logical exit from the building, wasn't it? That we'd, but, of course, yeah. you may deviate from that in a fire. You may, and firemen, certainly, firefighters, certainly would be looking all over the place. for. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the regulation and the notes on it used to say any route to a safe place. Mm-hmm. And so that caused big debate. And, again, then we started to see another amendment to this, this regulation where it was tweaked after going through the, the subcommittee again. And then it looked for uh, basically any cable must be pre- 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 fixed to stop premature collapse. Now, this, is, this isn't this is all cables at this point, is it? It, it didn't used to be. No. Um, so th- there was um, a cable that slipped through the net. So as we know, um, the regs covers all voltages, um, AC from 0 to 1,000, DC to 1,500. Well, fiber optic cables, you might say they carry zero volts, so they, yeah. they, they, but they, they carry light effectively, yeah. but they still have the same entanglement issue as a cable that's got copper inside it. Yes, yeah, still have the ability to entangle, don't they? Yes. That's what we're trying to, to avoid here in the regulations. So we've just seen a, a recent change where the scope has been increased mm. to include fiber optic cables as part. So now this brings another question then to you guys over at the, the IT. We rightly or wrongly believe that this regulation really only applies to electricians. 
That would be wrong, wouldn't it, Michael? Yes, definitely. Um, it applies to anybody installing cables. Um, we, we, we know that, um, probably shouldn't mention the people, but the people that install the telephones, <laughs> uh, the people that install the satellite dishes, they, they, they think that they're excluded from the regulations. But as we've just said, any cable from zero up to 1,000 or 1,500, yeah. if it's DC, is included. So that is all included in BS. It's an interesting area, though, isn't it? Because they wouldn't, by dent of their work, consult the regs. So they wouldn't necessarily see that regulation. I mean, I know there's, they ought to be aware of it. But how is that information given to all those people outside the industry? I, I suppose it's for them to pick up on it. It isn't for the industry to go to them. It's negligent otherwise. They have, they have to go to the regulations and identify that they're working within the scope of BS 7671. So this is where let's say someone installing data and I've seen lots of this where they put on the sticky pads and then all of a sudden they use the tie wrap and they bunch the cables yeah. around that part there and they think that's okay. It's quite clear that that is not okay where that cable could prematurely collapse in the event of a fire and create entanglement. That's what we're looking to stop. A lot of electricians really did have a go at me about when that came out, the premature collapse, but didn't include data cables. They said, "Why? how are they yeah. getting away with it? We, yeah. We've got to do this now. Why are they getting away with it? So what was the pressure that came to bear to bring that in? Was it just an awareness it wasn't being done or was there actually a, 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 a petition that said it should be included? Uh, th th there's just awareness that... Um electricians are probably the only people that follow the wire regs in general yeah. um, that that was probably the, the awareness yeah so now uh, we are required if there is a cable that is liable to collapse um, under the event of a fire that cable must be secure with something metallic mm. so our options we could go for actually not something metallic Oh. A non-combustible material. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. That's yeah. really yeah. important <laughs> point, that is, actually, Dave. Um, and a, a metal? Lot, <laughs> they mean metal? We get slated quite a lot, and people will say, why can't the IET get the blame for writing the wire and regs, even though it's JPL 64? Why, why can't they just say what they mean? Yeah. Well, the reason for that, that one there is, um, this is quite interesting, is that if we write it has to be metal, if there's a manufacturer out there that's come up with this plastic fireproof clip, mm. we've just excluded them from the wiring regulations. So um, that's why we have to be very careful with the word. So, right. So, okay. So, cables have to be secure with something that is non-combustible. How about that, Dave? <laughs> I'll accept that. Yeah, yeah. okay, right. So, this would see us go for, we could use metal tray. and Metal clips. Metal clips. <laughs> metal conduit. I mean, metal tray is one on its own. But, but if that metal tray is installed vertically on a wall and I use these plastic tie wraps, that wouldn't comply, would it? No, it no. wouldn't. No, because it's the it's the fixing. So it's the, the the method of fixing the cable to the tray. So so again, that point, I'd have to refer to the metal tie wraps. But I remember a, a couple of questions came to me about can I just secure them with metal tie wraps? If I just secure cables together with metal tie wraps and they are fixed, so they won't fall. That's enough. Is that acceptable? Depends what they're fixed not to. They're not in tray. Yeah. If they were fixed to something solid that was not going to come combustible, yeah. Combustible, yeah. yeah. So that so, would work. So my last visit to a commercial job, which was going to have a suspended false ceiling, as they called it, or a suspended ceiling uh, in just below, all the trades were going above this. The contractor just used all-round banding. Just mm. put a loop of that. Every foot, he'd put another loop of that, and he was just literally using that as a wiring loom almost. That, that for would be self-supporting, wouldn't it? Such a thickness of cable banded together, they yes. would not fall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the <coughs> argument comes into play when you're using uh, methods such as that, and um, I think it was the BRE that did a report on this. Um, what method are you using to fix into the substrate? They did, you're right, they did. So, so the concrete slab that's there, the BRE done a report that looked at should you or should you be not using plastic rule plugs yes. and that was the, in fact yeah. the report came out and said plastic rule plugs if they're used okay or in used in line with manufacturers requirements they are considered okay mm. so don't think you need to go replacing plastic rule plugs because you don't. I, if i remember rightly premature collapse was defined as within about half an hour wasn't it was that i don't think there's anything any time though was yeah. there? but i mean there's an understanding because you've got to define premature yeah how long yeah. is that an hour two hours three hours yeah uh, you, you're right i don't know the actual time but what it is is it's um it's an assessment that needs to be made on the amount of time that a firefighter could be in the building. Yeah. Remember, they're not coming in the 
the building to put the fire out. We, we don't do that. We, we, yeah. you know, we only come in the building to rescue people. So if, if, they, if the fire crew are turning up and the building is ablaze, they're not going to send people in. No. So at that point there, it doesn't matter what's happening to them cables. It really no. doesn't. But this is the initial, the early effects of that heat that's coming from the cables or from the fire onto the cables. Would that then mean that their methods of being secure fails? Them cables then dropping, stopping me trying to get out in the event of a fire. That's what we're looking at here. And again, this is only for cables that are surface mounted. If we look for cables that are in the fabric of the building, so they're behind plasterboard, mm. dot and dabs walls, or for instance, or they're, they're plastered in, we don't have to go putting these additional fixings in for those types of cables, Michael, do we? No, that, that is um, a good point. And it's something that people went a little bit mad for when it, when it first came out. So you can buy all these um, metal twin and earth clips, etc. Yep. And they were first fixing bungalows yep. and using metal clips. Um, and, and like you say, there's no point. Um, a normal plasterboard offers 30 minutes of fire protection. Um, within a domestic dwelling, we'll keep it simple in a domestic dwelling, um, it's very unlikely that a firefighter is going to be rescuing people for 30 minutes. Yeah, no, um, yeah that's, it's, that's, it's a couple really of minutes. Ablaze, isn't it? Yeah, really ablaze. So although there are things out in the market, you need to look at where you're going to be using these because there's some really good, fantastic products out there, but um, maybe a bit of an overkill in some areas. Well, I think a lot of people realise there's a great market here and they've jumped onto it. So you've now got a plethora of choices um, and nice to have, but yeah. I think you're right, mustn't overfit it's crazy to spend money you don't need to spend as long as uh, it's a safe installation. I mean, I, I can see why contractors are doing it because if I've got, for instance, I've got a, a, my left pocket full of plastic clips, my right pocket full of metal ones, what one do I use? I might as well just, just go for the metal ones. I'd, I would probably do that myself. Well, of course, I'll just, just go metal. Going completely left field on an, an ecological point of view, the less plastic we have, the better. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if yeah. we go down the metal route, yeah. they are degradable in time. Yeah. So And recyclable. And recyclable. So they're a preferable choice, to be honest, if the price difference isn't too much. Now, Michael, if we're talking about this premature collapse part, and the, it talks about um, any route to safety is what it used to talk about, or the escape route, that then got removed. We've seen escape route come back into the regulations, haven't we, recently, yeah. with regards to a... Protected yes, escape a protected route. escape route. This was something brand new to us in Amendment 2, but not brand new to the industry, of course, because these escape routes have been in the building regs for a while, haven't they? But wh- wh- why, is, why have the regs felt the need to bring it into the electrical environment? Yeah, so that's a really good question, Dave. Um, like you say, escape routes and protected escape routes have been around for a long time. You might remember in the 18th edition, we had um, utilisation categories for the type of building, BD2, BD3, yeah, low yeah, occupancy, etc., you know etc., and nobody did. And that's, <laughs> and that's why we've, we felt that we've, we've, we've brought it up to date. So um, one of the recent additions to the JPL subcommittee B, which is the committee that looks after fire protection, is we've, we've brought in some fire engineers. Uh, and what, okay. what they've tried to help us do is try to make BS 7671 align with the building reg. So when we call up an architect and say BD2, they don't say what no, you're on about. Mm-hmm. They say... yeah. We understand. Yes. That, so you'll get, you're, you're getting a standard now that will go across multi-trades. Yes. Yeah. But what, why, why this has sort of raised some questions is it, it wasn't particularly familiar for electricians. Um, but nothing's changed as such. Um, an escape route has not automatically over not become a protected escape route. That There are two different types of escape routes. And if you look at Part B of the building regulations, it doesn't actually talk about protected escape routes as such. It talks about protected lobbies, protected stairs, protected corridors. And it's all to do with um, tra- travel distances, etc. So if you can't meet the required travel distance, you might need to turn it into a protected escape route. But the important thing here is no electricians are qualified, or I suggest they're probably not, um, to determine whether uh, an area is an escape route or a protected escape route. So it's a matter of speaking to the fire engineer responsible. So if you're getting drawings now, what we are urging you to do is, rather than trying to apply the requirements of Part 4, where it talks about protected escape route to your projects, the first thing you need to do is you need to contact the building designer, the architect or the building designer, whoever it may be, and you need to ask them, is this part I'm looking at on the drawing, is it a protected escape route? If it is, you need to apply them requirements. If it isn't, or they don't know, you just apply the general part of mm. BS7671. And then they go and go back to them, 
maintaining the the cable integrity with a metal clip or sorry a non-combustible clip every so often yep. so you do you do those but apart from that you don't really need to, to so go down that safe way. to say you're never going to know you're not going to be able to have to make the decision is this a protected skateboard or not it will be defined it, not as an electrician it will certainly be it'll be defined by the fire engineer so if you're working on a big project there'll be a set of drawings called the fire strategy drawings and they'll show you um the fire resistance of all the walls i'll show you the escape routes etc etc yeah. Now, just thinking, having just asked that question, you know there are some hotels that, like, they've sometimes got these dystopian concrete stairwells at the back that you can come down, and yeah. they literally do seem to comply with what is a protected escape route. Would we retrospectively be thinking about them in that way and therefore not installing cabling in them? If it was determined to be a protected escape route, yes. So you you chase back and say, was this, when it was built defined as a protected escape route or a protected route or whatever the terminology yeah, was. Yeah, that's, that's Cause the way to go. It would be a protected stairwell, wouldn't it? Yes. It would be called a protected yes, stairwell. It would, if yeah. it was, you would treat it now as a protected escape route. If you was carrying out any works now, but obviously the changes in the regulations are not retrospective. So. No. Yeah, so again, it's hard to apply our logic now to installations that have been there for a while. So this is, a, this is again, it's something that the contractors are really going to struggle with. What, what I'd say is, don't try and apply these new regulations to existing building stock because you're just not going to be able to do it. You may find, as you suggested, Dave, a corridor that would comply, but it doesn't. Com- it complies by default. It wasn't designed by like right. to, to comply with that. So don't go applying the. The, the the logic to it even though the logic fits it'd be wrong just to keep just p- applying that logic to it mm. really it's for, this is for new builds new builds that are coming in that protected escape route is there however the other requirements where we should or shouldn't be fixing our cables has been there for quite a while now mm. and it has been widened to include all possible routes so not just those cables that are fixed to the surface and are in escape routes it's all cables really and it's those cables as we said earlier on those that are even fibre optic now. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody's got their fingers crossed that somebody will come up with a non-combustible material <laughs> and everybody can relax. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you've liked this podcast, please subscribe, make sure you share and like what you're hearing and also see if you can come and join us at one of our tech talks, oh, which are going around nice. the UK at the yeah, moment. Nice yeah. to see you. So yeah, come and do that. Uh, until next time, thank you, Michael, for all your efforts today. It's been great for you popping in. And thank you very much, Dave. And thank you to the listener for listening to another CF Tech Talking Podcast. Well, thank you, Darren.